Well, tonight I want to read this one verse, and, um, and I think you'll uh, be blessed by this message. And it, it isn't going to be, I don't think, too long, unless you don't respond well, then we'll add points as we go along. But uh, it really is just one verse, and I hope, I hope that it will be an encouragement to you. Um, and so let's read uh, in verse 4, and I'd like you to read it with me if you would tonight. And I'm, I'm serious now, tonight, we all, we all have uh, so many things on our minds, and uh, I, I would be lying if I didn't say this is a heavy on my heart and mind with Dr. Goddard. This ought to be a night where you, as always, pray for pastor. Pray for pastor. I think this is pastor appreciation day. I'm not sure. But I would I'll tell you this. Dr. Bobby Robertson said, you want to be a blessing to your pastor? Be in your place. And, and you're doing that tonight. But you'll, you could help tonight if you pray as I preach and, and stay right with it. And that'd be such a blessing. Verse 4, I rejoiced greatly that I found of thy children walking in truth as we have received a commandment from the Father. One more time. I rejoice greatly that I found of thy children walking in truth as we have received a commandment from the Father. Let's pray. Father, we love you and we thank you for this time. And Lord, I thank you for our church family. And Lord, we always uh, feel such a loss. And I know, Lord, it's selfish. And, and forgive me for that, Lord, but it's a, it's a loss to us, even though it's heaven's gain. And Father, we just pray that you would raise up more men like Dr. Jerry Goddard. Father, that you would help us tonight to learn from such a time like this. And Lord, that you would help us to recognize our need uh, for you in this hour. Lord, we pray that throughout this service that your Holy Spirit would work and speak to us. And we ask it all in Jesus' name. Amen. You may be seated. Christian living, in order to be blessed, must be constantly assessed. I want you to hear this and just let it sink in, please. Christian living, in order to be blessed, must be constantly assessed. Now, nothing in your life that's done that will be great for God or great in any sense will be done without much assessment. A few weeks ago, we paid a professional to come and to assess the teachers at Lancaster Baptist School. I received, Brother Ewing, I'm going to say about a 300-page notebook on the assessment. I read, and I'm still reading through, but I've read many of the assessments on the teachers. Uh, we have, every spring, the certified financial uh, auditors coming, the CPA, and they assess the stewardship of the Lancaster Baptist Church finances. Uh, we have uh, annual board meetings for the college, and we have uh, every uh, maybe four to six weeks uh, in the church, the deacons meeting. And I think about these times, these are assessment times uh, to make sure that things are being taken care of, whether it's the widows of the church, whether it's finances or missionaries, whatever it is. In your life, if there's something that matters to you, you make assessment of it. Most of you, from time to time, actually check the balance of your checking account, and you assess where you're at. And most of you uh, make some assessments medically, and you check your blood pressure, and you uh, check things about your physical life. Anything that matters to you will be assessed by you. Why is it that we often do not assess where we are spiritually? This is why we have Sunday night church. This is why we have revival meetings, because the Bible is a mirror, and we're to look into the perfect law of liberty, and we're to let God tell us what he wants us to know about our spiritual condition. And this is called spiritual assessments. Now, John, in this verse, is speaking about a spiritual assessment. He is expressing joy as he has made an assessment of the church, the lady to whom he is writing, likely the church at Ephesus. Whether this was from a first-hand visit, like an auditor or an educational consultant, or whether this was from hearing reports from others, whatever the sourcing of the information, 
he had received a good assessment or made a good assessment of the church. And they were a church that was walking in the truth, and he was a spiritual elder that was rejoicing in that truth. In fact, he says here in verse number four that he is rejoicing that he has found of the children walking in the truth. Now, there is no greater joy for a parent than to see a child walk in the truth. There's no greater joy for a Sunday school teacher than to see someone in their class walking in the truth and applying something that they've learned. There's no greater joy for a pastor than to see a church member or a church department or teenagers or single adults walking in the truth and living out what they have learned from the Word of God. John Stott wrote of this one verse, There is much in the local fellowship to give him cause for rejoicing, Yet he knew that not all the church members were living consistently. Some things never change. And the truth of the matter was that this book was written because there were some that were not walking in the truth. And this is always the burden of a parent. It's always the burden of a pastor. It, I believe, can age a pastor. I believe it can affect a pastor. I believe it, it, it's something that a pastor feels uh, when someone is neglecting the word and walking away from the Lord and, and living an ungodly life. And this is why these epistles were written, for some were not walking according to the truth. But with respect to this moment, with respect to what he had recently heard or seen at Ephesus, the Holy Spirit gives us verse 4, it was a rejoicing moment. By the way, how many of you are thankful for those rejoicing moments? Amen. I mean, it's a bummer when your child uh, gets a note home from school that he wasn't acting too well, and, uh, but it's always a blessing when you get the note that says he had a good day. And, and in fact, how many of you are like me? You frame it, <laughs> and, uh, and you want to remember it. In my office upstairs on one of the shelves, I have the decision card of my son, Matthew, seventh grader, at, t at the youth conference. And it, it, it has his decision. It has the counselor's signature on it. And I think it's a picture of what I'm trying to tell you. The decision of Matthew at the youth conference was called to preach. Called to preach. How many of you know that made his daddy's heart happy? By the way, he preached last Sunday to 460 people and had 19 baptized. That's a blessing. Amen. Called to preach. The counselor who signed the card, whose name I will not tell you, has left his wife and is no longer living for the Lord Jesus Christ. That's the other burden I was trying to tell you about just a moment ago. So in life and in ministry, there are the blessings and there are the burdens. But in this verse, we see the rejoicing of the fact that so many were walking in the truth. Now notice three thoughts with me tonight from this verse. First of all, I want you to notice that we are observing spiritual rejoicing. Spiritual rejoicing. In verse number four, I rejoiced greatly. Do you understand that there are different kinds of rejoicing? Do you understand that first of all, physical rejoicing is temporal? Physical rejoicing is temporal. You say, well, what is physical rejoicing? Physical rejoicing is the 49ers and the Cowboys. Physical rejoicing is the stock market. Physical rejoicing is football and basketball. Physical rejoicing. Now, football and basketball and sports can build discipline that can be applied to spiritual growth, and there's nothing wrong with bringing our body to subjection, and there's, it's wonderful to have things like sports that can teach Christian character, but I'm here to tell you at the end of the day, there are many people who are amazing athletes and lousy Christians. Physical rejoicing. Luke chapter 15 and verse number 8 says this, Either what woman, having ten pieces of silver, if she lose one piece, doth not light a candle and sweep the house and seek diligently till she find it? And when she hath found it, she calleth her friends and neighbors together, saying, Rejoice with me, for I have found the piece, of, uh, the piece which I lost. Likewise I say unto you, there is joy in the presence of the angels of God over one sinner that repenteth. So we, we rejoice 
over the physical things, and that's fine. But there's a greater kind of rejoicing, and that is the spiritual rejoicing. And I believe that this before us is the spiritual kind of rejoicing. So physical rejoicing is temporal, and spiritual joy rejoicing is eternal. First Thessalonians 2 and 19. For what is our hope or joy or crown of rejoicing? Are not even ye in the presence of our Lord Jesus Christ at his coming? For ye are our joy and crown. You watch the missionaries next week. They'll tell us about a building they built. They'll tell us about uh, some rice that they grew or whatever. But when they start talking about souls that were saved and lives that were changed and preachers that were called, there's a special joy in their heart because they know that if that mission field closes tomorrow, the work will go on because people have been saved and discipled. It's a spiritual, it's an eternal kind of rejoicing. And the greatest type of rejoicing is when people get saved and people get baptized. I had a family that walked out this morning as they were leaving and they shook my hand and said some things and they said, Pastor, with broad smiles on their face, we never get over seeing people come to trust Christ as Savior at Lancaster Baptist Church. It's a spiritual kind of rejoicing. They rejoice in heaven about it. We ought to rejoice here on earth about it. And so we see tonight that this rejoicing, I rejoice greatly. He's not rejoicing at the ballerina. He's not rejoicing at the Dodgers. He's not rejoicing at the, at the BB gun shooting or whatever the case might be. And parents, don't get me wrong, you ought to rejoice in every success of your child. But I, I see so often times daddies that wouldn't miss the sideline of a football game, daddies that jump up and down and they're so excited uh, about a basketball game, and, and yet uh, they're not too excited about soul winning, not so excited about attending the house of God. And if you're not careful, you're going to set the wrong priority in your family. We need to understand something tonight that we as spiritual leaders need to rejoice about those things that are eternal. We need some dads and some moms this week not going, oh, we got homework, and oh, we got this, and I'm so tired. And now we've got the mission conference. Rather, we ought to say, man, we get to hear the missionaries next week. We have an opportunity to invest in eternity next week. What a blessing this is going to be. And why did they have children walking in the truth? Because they had mommies and daddies walking in the truth. And because of that, they were able to have a spiritual kind of rejoicing. Let me ask you a question tonight. What makes you happy? What makes you rejoice? I, I'm here to say that if you were to ask me who won the Super Bowl last year and the year before, I might get last year. I don't know if I can. I don't know. I, I, I know they're having baseball playoffs right now. And um, I think one of them's Philadelphia, maybe the Astros. I'm not sure. But I'm, but I'm here to tell you it's all fine. It's all wonderful. But there are some greater things in life than the temporal things. And being a Christian means that we get happy about spiritual victories. And this is what we see from John the Elder. He was tickled, as my granddad used to say. My granddad used to say, that just tickles me. And he was tickled about the fact that God was at work at the First Baptist Church of Ephesus. It made him happy. There was a spiritual rejoicing. I don't know about you. I want heaven to rejoice about what happens at Lancaster Baptist Church. I don't know about you, I want to see people rejoicing in the fact that more missionaries are being sent, more things are being done for God, and that we have part in it. And so we see a spiritual rejoicing. But I want you to notice, secondly tonight, in this verse, there is a parental revelation. Now, parents, I want you to see this and learn from it tonight. No doubt there's an application for me as a pastor, no doubt for every Sunday school teacher, but I think for parents as well, if you notice what it says there in verse 4, I rejoice greatly, okay, I rejoiced, spiritual rejoicing, that I found of thy children walking in truth. Now here the apostle, the elder says, I found. In other words, this life of truth, this observation that people were living out the truth is something that he discovered whether by hearing it or seeing it, it was something that he had made an assessment about as a spiritual elder. And as I said just a moment ago, Christian living, if it will be blessed, if we will advance, we must be constantly assessing 
how our class is doing, how we are doing. As a pastor, I'm constantly praying through the church directory and calling your names before the Lord and thinking about you and where are you and where's the school parent and where's this class headed and what's happening in the singles ministry? What am I doing? Constantly assessing, constantly watching. Why? Because I love and because I care and because I want God to bring about spiritual blessings so that there will be spiritual rejoicing. But it takes a lot of assessment. Some of you men worked in aerospace. You don't just fling that hunk of metal up into the sky. There are entire people, groups of people whose lives are involved in flight test engineering. They test and test and test. And, and, and many men in this room, it's been their responsibility at times to say, this bird is not ready to fly. I don't know if it's a pink slip or yellow or what it is or just a report you write up. But if you say it, that plane is going nowhere because you have assessed that it is not ready. You're not going to have a successful Air Force without constant assessment. And we will not have victory for God without constant assessment. The Holy Spirit assessing us. The Word of God assessing us. Now, John has a revelation. And I want you to see how the Bible speaks of it. It says, I found of thy children. Let's say that together. I. Found. Say it again. I. Found. What have you found of your children? How do you assess your family's direction? We're going to send this link to every family in the school, Brother Ewing. Because sometimes parents are oblivious to their children's direction. They don't know who their children's friends are. They don't know how their grades are. Our parents are better than most. But some parents, I'm told in public schools, some of the public school teachers say, the parents don't even come to the parent-teacher meetings. They have no clue what's going on in their child's life. Many parents, good Christian parents, have no clue what their children watch on television. They don't know if their child has ever been able to really excel in, in some spiritual discipline because they've never taken the time to really assess that part of their life. I was watching one of our players last night. He had a couple of really good plays, and I've so enjoyed coming out to some of the practices or just seeing his dad in the parking lot and talking to him and having his dad tell me how he reads certain scriptures with his family two, three nights a week, and then he asks them questions, and he asks them to tell what they got from the Scripture. He's trying to assess what's going on in their heart. Now, how, do, how does a parent have this revelation? How, how can we have it revealed to us? Because no parent wants to be a blind-sighted parent. By the way, if you're, if you're a blind-sighted, S-I-G-H-T-E-D, parent, you will be a blind-sighted parent. If you're not observing, if you're not assessing constantly the direction of your child spiritually, academically, it's often the case that you're going to one day be surprised, whether it's a report card or whether it's the police station or whether it's some difficulty that they've come to. And it normally is the fact that there hasn't been a lot of singular, uh, small assessments going on along the way, just a lot of negligence and suddenly, pastor, pastor, and I'm happy to help but I'm trying to help you tonight. I'm trying to help you tonight that we need to be making the small assessments along the way before the big emergency comes. So how do you do that? I want to give you three quick ways on how to find the revelation of your family or of your class or of your ministry. First, you find by instruction. You find how they're doing by constantly instructing and leading. Paul says this in 1 Corinthians 4.14, I write not these things to shame you, but as my beloved sons I warn you, for though ye have 10,000 instructors in Christ, ye have not many fathers. For in Christ Jesus I have begotten you through the gospel. Wherefore, I beseech you, be ye followers of me. Now, would you turn to that passage tonight quickly, 1 John chapter 4, uh, excuse me, 1 Corinthians chapter 4 and verse 14. Here we see the Apostle Paul speaking of the instruction that he gave. 1 John 4, 14. I write not these things to shame you. By the way, 
Most good, loving pastors and parents, they're not trying to just give a guilt trip. They're trying to help. Paul said, I'm not trying to shame you. He says, I, I, as, as beloved sons, I'm warning you. Okay? Dads, it's, it's not like you're always throwing a guilt trip out or we're not shaming our children. You're, you're the dumbest kid or the stupidest kid. That's not the idea. But we love our children enough to warn them, to admonish them when they're not living for Jesus. Verse 15, for though you have 10,000 instructors in Christ, ye have not many fathers. For in Christ Jesus I have begotten you through the gospel, wherefore I beseech you, be ye followers of me. Now let me give you a few thoughts from this verse, simple thoughts. First, young people, do not try to replace your parents. So well, I don't like them. They're too strict, this or that. Let me tell you something. God has given you your parents. And moms and dads in this church, if there's a teenager that comes to you and they're, they're complaining about their parents, do not take the side of another teenager over their parents. That is not your place to become a wedge. You say, well, I'm concerned about something. Well, you may talk to the parent. You may talk, uh, talk to me as pastor, talk to someone else. But you do not start driving a wedge between mom and dad and their kids, even if things aren't exactly right. They don't, they don't have many fathers. They have one father. They have one mother. And they, perhaps in the sense of a blended family, there might be something different. But what I'm saying here is that the instruction primarily is to come from mom and dad to these children. Don't try to replace your parents, and don't you try to be the replacement parent. And I've seen this. Sometimes you'll have a parent, and they're kind of dogmatic about things, like I might have been when I was a parent. They're kind of strong, and so you'll see a teenager. Teenagers like to start shopping for counsel and picking someone that will believe and trust in them and, and someone that will take their side. So they'll stay over at someone's house and they'll say, oh, this is so nice that you let your family watch these movies with nudity and cursing. My parents are so mean, they don't allow that. My parents say that I'm dumb. My parents say that uh, they, they didn't even want me to come over here. My parents this, my parents that. Pretty soon this other family over here is like, oh, we're so sorry your family's so strict. Here, you let us help you and we'll kind of help take care of you. And what I'm trying to say is, listen, if you're helping another uh, child or having them stay at your house or you're working with them in some way, don't try to replace their mom and dad. In fact, you ought to say things like this. I don't, I don't think your mom and dad would ever try to do something that would harm you. Your mom and dad are good people. And you're blessed to have a mom and dad that put you in the Christian school or that come to church. You ought to look for every chance you can to speak kindly about those parents. Come on, somebody help me tonight. You say, but pastor, I have reason to believe maybe there is a problem. Then you go directly to the parent. You, you, you come to pastor. You, come, you, you try to solve the problem. But you're never right to tell a child how bad their parents are. Those children need their mom and dad, and they need you to be a supporter of God's institution. And I'm not saying to cover up wrongdoing. I'm not saying that, but I'm saying how many moms and dads are here to admit you've made parenting mistakes already? Come on, my hand's up, right? Right? We all make parenting mistakes, and we don't want someone else leveraging that against us. We want to support mom and dad. Let me say this. Don't try to replace your pastor. Don't try to replace your pastor. Say, why are you saying that? Notice what it says. It says, uh, ye have not many uh, instructors in Christ, not many fathers, for in Christ Jesus I have begotten you through the gospel. Wherefore I beseech you, be you followers of me. Now I'm going to be very clear. This is not an insecure bone in my body as I say this. I, I'd say this in any church anywhere. But we live in a media age, a multimedia age. We live in this social media age. And every kind of a yahoo out there who hasn't led you to Christ, who hasn't labored for 37 years in your midst, who hasn't uh, been, uh, been a part of all this, look, at they all want to have a piece of the action. They all are reaching out. And if you're not careful, you'll start to compare. Well, I heard this guy online. I heard this guy on the radio. And, you know, Pastor Chapel, he's so tough on this issue. After all, he still has Sunday night. Can you believe it? Amen. I got three amens right there. 
Pastor Chapel still bangs on the pulpit and tells us that we ought to support the other parents and support the church. And he's such a Baptist. So many of them have dropped the name Baptist and why he doesn't even let uh, people do this or people do that. Now listen to me. There are plenty of guys who'll find an easier pathway for you. But here's what I'm saying. God has instituted the church and the under shepherd and be careful about shopping for something that you feel more comfortable with when God has given you what he's given to you. Every teenager sometimes wants a different parent, and every church member sometimes wants a different route. But I'm here to tell you, instruction, instruction from God-ordained channels. Proverbs 4 and verse 1, Solomon said, hear the instruction of your father. It's a great challenge these days. It's been a challenge for probably 20 years now for pastors trying to give instruction. And I'm not talking about Yahoo guys that are off on some, you know, banny wagon type stuff all the time. I'm not talking about that. In years gone by, I've preached against even some independent Baptists that just, they just got off base. I recognize all of that. But I'm saying when you have a mom and dad doing their best and they're in church and they're trying to live for the Lord, or you have a pastor that's being faithful year in and year out and marrying and burying and serving and caring and preaching and trying to be a blessing, then understand God's pattern for this, one of the ways that you can see and learn is by the way you're responding to the teaching and to the authority that is given in the home. And so by instruction, you can have revelation. I have, I have oftentimes the ability to see how someone's doing by the way they receive preaching. When I think about men like Dr. Goddard and Bill Weibel and so many of these men, I'd get up here on a Sunday night, break a knuckle or two, preach away as long as I could, preach against every sin known to man. And these elder men of God, they'd come up and say, preacher, thank you for that message tonight. And oftentimes you'll find those are, you can sense they're not listening like they once did. Instruction. Notice secondly, the second way that you can have the revelation or find out how your children are doing is by interaction with them interaction. Turn, if you would, to Philippians chapter 4 and verse 9. Philippians chapter 4 and verse 9. I want you to see this here. Philippians 4, 9. A very simple verse about interacting with your family. And here it says, and of course the, the context of this is the church family, but I, I want to make a, an application to your family. Verse 9. Those things which ye have both learned and received and heard and seen in me do, and the God of peace shall be with you. Now let's read that verse together. What a great verse. Ready? Begin. Those things which ye have both and received and heard and seen in me do, and the God of peace shall be with you. So here with your child, with your class, uh, there is going to be a time of learning, uh, they're understanding something intellectually, they're receiving something spiritually, they're, they're taking it in, they're hearing it. But notice that phrase, and seen in me. Let's say that together, and seen in me. Seen in me. People do what people see. People do what people see. Now listen, dads, your children in their interaction with you need to see some very important basic things. They need to see you in church and enjoying it. They need you to be saying, all right, everybody, let's go. It's time to go to church. They need to see that you're happier on the way to God's house than you are doing the other things I mentioned earlier. Nothing wrong with going to a Dodgers game. We took our kids to lots of them, took our kids to a few of the Lakers games and all these different types of things. But let me tell you something. It's always a happy time to go to God's house. And, and, and dads, they need to see it in you, the things that they see in you. They need to see us coming to church. Let me, let me say some basic things. I'm trying to help you tonight. They need to see you bringing your Bible to church, Dad. They need to see that you love this book. They need to see that pastor's saying something, and you're looking, and you're studying, and maybe you're taking it home, and they, they may see you studying it some more at home, but they need to see in you. Look, look at, do not think that you can come to church haphazardly and that you can never open a Bible and that you can never pray and that you gobble your food down without praying like my dog does at home. Do not think that you can live that way and think that you bring your kids to the youth group and everything's going to be just fine. They've got to see it in you at home. Amen. Seen in me. 
They need to see you in church. They need to see you with your Bible. Hey, they need to see you writing your tithe check. They need to see it. My boys, sometimes they'd come into the desk there on a Saturday night. They'd, they'd see their dad writing out the tithe. Sometimes I'd explain missions or 10%. Maybe it's now seeing you type in the online. They need to know that Jesus is first in your family. They need to sense this. It's something that is a part of the interaction. They ought to see in you the grace of God. Moms and dads, they ought to see in you that God is at work. The teenagers of this church, they ought to be able to say, my mom and dad, they forgive each other. My dad speaks kindly to my mother. They ought to be able to say, I've, I've heard my dad ask mom for forgiveness sometimes. They ought to be able to sense that you're growing in the grace of God. It's okay for a dad to say to his wife, honey, I'm sure sorry about that. I didn't mean to snap off like that. Please forgive me. It's okay. The things that you have seen in me do. The other night, or I guess it was yesterday, was our oldest grandson's 13th birthday. Can you imagine that? 13. Little Camden, little dude, 13 years old. And I remember when he was born, just uh, such a blessing in our life, right? Right on the tail end of Larry's chemotherapy, and here came this blessing into our life. I asked Peter the other day, I said, what, what'd you do for Camden's birthday? He said, well, he said, we went up into the mountains. He said, there's a spot we have up there. And he said, we took some wood and we made a special place where we can pray. He said, we talked about this rite of passage into adulthood. We talked about moral purity. We talked about enjoying the teen years. We talked about going ahead and just having fun serving Jesus. They said we spent some time in prayer together. And then they went and did some fun things later in the day. And, and he took some time to show his son, to interact with his son, to understand his son's heart. And I, what I'm saying is when John speaks here in, in 2 John in verse 4, and he says, I found of thy children. You don't find how your children are doing if you don't spend time with them. Love is spelled T I. M E. And here we see John found this out. And a dad that's getting up to the mountain to pray, and a dad that's spending time at church, and a, a dad that at home is opening up the Word of God, they're going to find out what's going on. There, there must be instruction. There must be interaction. Thirdly, there must be involvement with your children. I think in 1 Corinthians 11, 1, it says this, Be ye followers of me, as I also am of Christ. Let's say that together. Be ye followers of me as I also am of Christ. How many of you parents have found out it's almost humbling how our children copy us? And here we see this admonition from the Apostle Paul. Follow me as I follow Christ. Dads, would you say that with me? Follow me as I follow Christ. A little louder, dads. Follow me. That's why a dad should never stop being faithful to God, even if your kids are raised. A lot of these dads get in their 50s and 60s, and they start throttling back. What does it tell your kids? It tells them that Jesus was really important while they were younger, but now that they're raised, he's not as important. No, no, we want to follow the Lord all the days of our life. All the days of our life. Whether they're always living for the Lord or not, we want to be involved in faithfully serving the Lord. Jesus said, follow me, and I'll make you to become fishers of men. He said, I, I want to spend time with you. I want to, I want to observe your life. He, he said, I want to model some things before you. I want to help you as you walk in the truth. And so we notice, first of all, tonight, a spiritual rejoicing. He said, I rejoice greatly. Why? Because there was a, uh, there was a parental revelation. There was an assessment that he had made uh, that they were walking in the truth. And this was made as he spent time teaching them and spent time admonishing them and watching them. It was something that he knew to be true and what a great truth to know. Then notice finally tonight, there is a scriptural remembrance. Now, what was it that was revealed to him? Notice verse 4, I rejoice greatly that I found of thy children walking in truth as we have received a commandment from the Father. Now, here's what he remembered. First of all, he notices that they are walking. Stay with me now. 
They are walking in the truth. This speaks of abiding. Th this means the, the, the kids are not just learning some verses for the Bible test. That's good. And one of the dangers, moms and dads, of kids in a great youth group like this one and, and in a great school like ours is that kids can learn how to conform periodically. And, and later on in their life, if it was only conformity, they'll resent that. What we are truly more importantly invo involved in is the conforming of the heart for the Lord. And this, this word walking tells us that it wasn't just something they put on once in a while, but it was something that meant something to them each and every day. Warren Wiersbe said, note the repetition of the word walk. The truth is not something we simply study or believe. It is a motivating force in our lives. It is not enough to know the truth. We must show it through our actions wherever we are. John 15, John the Apostle said, Abide in me and I in you, Jesus said, as the branch cannot bear fruit of itself except it abide in the vine. So John was rejoicing because they were walking in the truth. This was something that was a part of their life. This was something that they enjoyed. That's why we always commend the young person who says, can we have a prayer time at lunch? Or can we, uh, Dad, can I ask you a question? Or, uh, Dad, what does that verse mean? Or, 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 or when you discuss a sermon and, and it's something that they're involved in, it blesses your heart because it's, it's a part of their normal vernacular. It's a part of their normal interest. It's something that's becoming a part of their life. And this is what he was rejoicing about. They are walking in the truth. They're not just around the truth. They're not just hearing the truth. Listen, be ye doers and not what? Hearers only. Now, when you see your child say to another child, oh, that's okay, you can, you can have the last four french fries, you're like, hallelujah. Because they're practicing something you taught them. Watch this. You hear your child invite a friend to church and it's not soul winning. How many of you would say that's a thrill? Your child is witnessing, but it's not soul winning time. Wait a minute. Your child is discussing a verse or asking you about a verse and it's not to pass the Bible test. He's just walking in the truth. This is what John is talking about. He says, I'm just so spiritually rejoicing because I have found a revelation. I've heard a revelation about you. And what I've heard is that the truth is becoming a part of your life. This is the goal of the Christian life. Not simply to live the list. Now, wait a minute. If the list helps you to develop good habits, I'm not against lists, but I don't want to idolize the list. I want to live the list. Is everybody with me on that tonight? So they were walking, but notice then finally, they were walking in the truth. John 15, 7, abide in me and my words in you. Ye shall ask what you will and it shall be done unto you. Now notice the phrase here in 2 John 4. It says, I found of thy children walking in truth. Now what does it mean to walk in truth? I want to give you three thoughts here. Three things you want to look for as you work with your teens. Three things you want to look for as you work with your families and your classes. To walk in the truth, I believe, first involves discernment. I believe he's speaking here of spiritual discernment. Vitally important as we understand this. Now turn quickly to Philippians chapter 1 and verse 9. Philippians chapter 1 and verse 9. Philippians 1, 9, it says, And this I pray, that your love may abound yet more and more in knowledge and in all judgment. Everybody with me, say amen. amen. I pray that your love may abound more and more in knowledge and all judgment, that ye may approve things that are excellent. Now watch this. The world says love wins. Let me tell you what. Truth wins. Love without truth is not going to take you where you need to go. So here it says they were abounding. Their love was abounding more and more. That's good but it was abounding and it was bounded by knowledge and judgment, that ye may approve things that are excellent. Why? So that ye may be sincere without offense till the day of Christ. Now watch this. Some of you have the gift of mercy. Some of your children, they always take the side of the underdog. And, and they might feel like, 
Well, I just think Christians ought to love more, and we ought to just be more accepting. By the way, that's why the United Methodists just this past week said that from now on on their church roles, they're going to have male, female, cisgender, transgender. They're going to start keeping track of all that because they want to be inclusive, because they want to be loving. There's only one problem with that. They are not letting their love be bounded by truth. And when someone is walking in truth, when your teenager's walking in truth, it means that they're discerning. They can tell the devil's tricking others. They can sense that they, they should not follow after the lie of the devil. They are walking uh, in love, but they have this matter of knowledge and judgment, so they're approving things that are excellent, and they're realizing, hey, we, we can't put our stamp on that. That's not God's will. We can't put our stamp on immorality. We cannot put our stamp on cursing. We cannot put our stamp on Disney uh, when they're uh, showing what they're showing on the movies. We cannot uh, celebrate that. And I'm not saying, I'm not telling you what part uh, you can or can't go to something tonight. Don't get worried about it. I'm just telling you there ought to be enough discernment to say, I'm going to be careful with what I'm teaching my kids to love. You say, well, I'm not like you, Pastor. I, don't, I just don't want to be the killjoy of every family outing. I don't want you to be like me either. But I want you to walk in truth. And I am here to tell you that there's very little in the media today that you can enjoy without at least warning your family. And the minute you start thinking that your children love the Disney characters more than the Bible characters, sir, you have a problem. I'm just being honest with you tonight. I'm speaking the truth in love. You see, the world wants to be accepting. The world uh, doesn't want to be judgmental. And, and most teenagers today, and many millennials as well, they want to take the side of the underdog. And, and, and people say things, well, I just don't know why nobody likes me. And I don't know why they don't call me. They don't care for me. They don't, they don't want to tell uh, the other side of what they've been living in or what they've done. They want to just play the part of the underdog to gain, uh, to gain pity and so on and so forth. But there's a truth matter that we must understand. And, and so discernment, when we say walking in the truth, we're talking about discernment. And listen now, someone might say, well... I had all that discernment and all those rules, but then I, some, some preacher that preached all that, why he fell, he was, he was a fake. Now listen to me. I, I've been saved for 50 years. I've had many a hurt by people that I held in esteem. And this is what I had to come to, college students. Truth is still truth. We've had graduates leave our college and go work on a staff where the pastor ran off with the secretary six months into the ministry. How would you like to start your ministry with that? What do you say to those graduates? You tell them this. God is still on the throne. The Bible is still the Word of God. I'm very sorry that you were so hurt and disappointed, but learn from it that you'll never do it in your life to be faithful to God. But remember this, the truth is still truth. But so oftentimes people get hurt, they see some failure like that, and they drop the truth and they run to a more permissive lifestyle rather than staying in the truth. Somebody help me tonight. Walking in the truth means you have discernment. You're not going to get tricked out of God's will away from God's truth. You have discernment. Walking in the truth means that you have discernment. So many things come to my mind. If you're walking in the truth, you have discernment. You don't try to find a date in a bar. Oh, pastor, you shouldn't speak against bars like that. You're against everything. People in bars need Jesus. That's exactly right. Let's take a big old King James Bible down to the bar next Saturday night and preach repentance. How's that sound? I'm not talking about scooting your little self up there and sitting there and trying to, trying to get a boyfriend. I'm talking right now about the fact that if, you, if you're walking in the truth, you're not going to be walking into places like that. Look, at, you've got to have some discernment. You don't find God's will just putting your resume out somewhere and saying, well, let's just see what comes of this. I'll tell you what will come of it many times, a trick of the devil. you got to have discernment to recognize that there are ways to find God's will and ways that you'll not find God's will. Discernment. Secondly, if you're walking in the truth, it involves not only discernment, it also involves discipline. Now, let me just be very honest with you. Say with me, we're almost done. 
You're not going to walk in the truth unless you make it a priority in your life. I'll not ask for a raise of hands, but there are some in this room who get up every morning and you exercise. There are some who do not. You don't even have to raise your hand, all right? We understand. <laughs> there are others of us that are about maybe a little bit here and hardly, you can hardly tell. But for those who make that a part of their life, it's, it's something that they've decided. This is, this is a decision. I'm going to make lifting weights or whatever a part of my life. Can I just say to you, men, walking with God is such a decision. It's a decision. And I'm not here to say that if you're out of physical shape, you're out of spiritual shape. That's not what I'm saying at all. But what I'm saying is just as exercise is a decision, then you must be disciplined to walk daily in the Word of God. I try to counsel and help people. You sometimes say, why do you preach against the movies or the bars or this or that? When you spend as much time as a pastor does trying to put marriages together or get men off their pornography or whatever the case might be, if you just get back into the Word of God, it makes all the difference. Just getting back to the Word of God. And I like to sometimes say this, you sow a thought, it becomes an action. You sow an action, it becomes a habit. You sow a habit, it becomes your destiny. Nobody ever wanted to lose their family. Nobody ever wants to lose their testimony. It starts with a thought. The only way that I know how to bring my thoughts into captivity is through the blessed Word of God. By opening God's Word, by letting God's Word guide my heart and guide my mind. And the Scripture says in 1 Corinthians 9, 27, but I keep under my body and bring it into subjection, lest that by any means when I have preached to others, I myself should be a castaway. Paul said, or John said rather, I, I, I rejoice greatly that I found thy children walking in truth, meaning they were discerning things better. They were disciplined in the truth. You're not going to walk in the truth if you're not disciplined in the truth. And then the, finally, uh, the third area is the development that comes. When you receive the truth, and he says this in verse 4, he says, I found them walking in the truth, notice this, as we have received a commandment from the Father. This is, this is a, a developmental process. When our children are little, we give them baby food. How many of you remember the baby food, the, the world up peas and the world up pears? How many of you remember it? And how many of you remember uh, how they loved the pears and hated the peas, right? <laughs> it makes some faces. Our kids always spit all those peas out. And we'd have a little game. We'd keep putting it back in, putting it back in. And then how many of you mixed it in with the pears and tried to trick them? You do that too? And uh, we did that child abuse too like that. <laughs> but what are you doing? Just little by little, you're helping to develop them. You're helping them to grow little by little spiritually. Moms and dads and Sunday school teachers, when your class is walking in the truth, what does it mean? It means they're discerning. It means they're being more disciplined. And it means they're developing in the truth. Now, not every church will have 100% of their members walking in truth. That's for sure. But John said, I want to rejoice. Now, listen carefully. You ought never to have your devotions or walk in the truth for the pastor. I don't want you to do it for me. I want you to do it for the Lord, okay? Everybody give me an amen on that. Okay? But hear me. You ought to desire to have, it ought to be your desire that your life causes your elder, your pastor, to rejoice. That's not wrong. I want my life to cause you to rejoice. There are many reasons I want to live for Jesus. First is for Jesus. Then, my dear bride, my children, for this church, I don't ever want you to be ashamed that Paul Chapel was your pastor. I'd rather that you grieve my dying than grieve my living. But I don't want you to live out the Christian life for me. I want you to live it out for Jesus. But what I'm trying to show you here is that when you live it out for Jesus and you walk in the truth, the pastor's sure going to be happy about it. John, John the elder says, I rejoice greatly at the way you're doing, the way you're living. Man, that is awesome. Look at those teenagers over there witnessing like our football team did last night to the other team. Oh, look at those, look at those junior kids taking pies to the widows and 
Look at those husbands and wives loving on each other and encouraging each other and being faithful. What a wonderful testimony they had. And that is why we need the preaching of the Word of God. Why? Because not all bring joy, many bring sorrow. Look at 2 Timothy 4 and we'll be done. 2 Timothy 4, 2. A few verses over there. Paul says to Timothy, preach the Word. Be instant in season, out of season, reprove, rebuke, and exhort with all long suffering and doctrine. For the time will come when they will not endure sound doctrine. That time has come. The time will come. They'll say, hey, we don't need all the preaching. Come on, we don't need so many services. We don't need all this. We don't need this doctrine. They'll not endure it. But after their own lust, they'll heap unto themselves teachers having itching ears. Notice, and they shall turn away their ears from the truth and shall be turned unto fables. That happens. Sometimes people say, you know, just give us, give us the, the uh, Cliff's Notes version and, and we'll be on our way. And that happens. But I say to you that what we need in this hour is the unadulterated preaching of the Word of God. Amen. Prior to COVID, the average U.S. food retailer, ladies, you're going to love this. I read this in the paper, honey. It proves what you've been telling me. The average U.S. food retailer stocked over 33,000 different items, which was four times the choice of 1975. Imagine that. No, no, that that's why shopping confuses me. 33,000 items? Four times. So apparently, when I was a kid, it was a lot easier. You just go in there and just get what you need and get out. Now... There's, you know, probably 50 kinds of peanut butter. There's milk made out of almonds. I mean, what's the world coming to? <laughs> Poor cows. And this world's gotten crazy. It's just crazy. 33,000 33, before COVID, different types of things you could buy at the grocery store. Automakers offered, now listen to this, more than 605,000 vehicle configurations, and that does not count color choices. 600, and I, I don't know what that is, like two-door, four-door, this color leather, that color leather, power windows, not power, I, but 600,000 choices for cars. One commentator said, we've become addicted to endless varieties. We've become addicted to endless varieties. But that changed as the supply chain issues disrupted normal commerce. Supply chain issues came. And, and I know because I live with a professional shopper. And sometimes she'll have stuff delivered to the house. Sometimes she goes to stores. But almost every time she'll come home and she'll say, you cannot believe they don't even have eggs. They don't even have this. I remember the fastest I ever saw Terry run during the pandemic was for the last roll of toilet paper at Walmart. <laughs> now, I was blocking, I will admit, I was blocking. She was the running back, I was blocking. <laughs> you know what I'm talking about? Scarcity had come, right? And Terry comes back, even now she'll say, you just cannot believe, you cannot believe that didn't have this, and they didn't have this, and they didn't have this. They say that consumers are now getting content again with fewer choices. People are coming to a place where they're just realizing it. Wall Street Journal author said, the lesson that many companies are drawing from not being able to please everyone in the pandemic is that maybe they didn't need to try so hard in the first place. <laughs> Churches should take note. Sometimes churches try to do so many different things, so many culturally driven preferences, so many programs, that we could forget, ladies and gentlemen, that the reason we're here tonight is to get the truth and live the truth. Get the truth and live the truth. Get the truth and live the truth. Thank God for harvest festivals. Thank God for basketball games. Thank God for all the different things that we can do with fellow believers. But my primary job is not to be the social director of Lancaster Baptist Church. And your primary job is not to be the consumer that we have to keep happy 
with all the programs that we invent. Somebody help me tonight. My primary job is to preach this precious book. And all of our primary job is to love it and live it. And when we do, John said, I just rejoice. I rejoice that the elect lady is walking in the truth. I hope you parents have a rejoicing season upcoming. And I pray that our church rejoices, not just with what we're learning, but with the way we're living. That's what causes rejoicing. Let's stand together, shall we? Father, we thank you tonight that the elder, the Apostle John, could greatly rejoice because he had seen revealed in his own observations a people that were walking in truth, people that had discernment, people that had direction in their life. Father, would you help us to have the same? Our heads are bowed, our eyes are closed tonight. How many moms and dads would say, Pastor, I was helped tonight. I need to apply something from this message. Pray for me. Would you lift your hand tonight, moms and dads? Let's apply it, shall we? Let, let's be observing. Let's be assessing. Let's not be the parent that isn't really involved. How many of you are Sunday school teachers and bus captains and you're working with others in discipleship and you say, Pastor, God gave me some things as a teacher that I need to be assessing and watching for the growth. I want to use this in my ministry. Pray for me. Would you lift your hand tonight? God spoke to you about making some good assessments. How many teenagers tonight would say, and how many single adults? I want to be one of those that when, when my elders observe my life, it's cause for rejoicing that I'm living out the truth. I want to be that kind of a young person, Pastor. Pray for me. Would you lift your hand tonight? I want to be that kind of a young person. By the way, nothing wrong with a mom and dad. Nothing wrong with a teacher, a pastor, just thrilled to see God at work in your life. There might be someone here tonight without Jesus in their heart. If you don't know Christ as your Savior, we'd like to pray for you as well. Is there anyone here tonight who'd say, Pastor Chapel, I'm not sure that I'm a Christian. I'd like to know more about what that means. Please pray for me. Would you lift your hand tonight? Is there someone like that? Anyone like that? Father, we ask tonight that we would bring rejoicing into this world as we walk in the truth, the truth that you have given. Bless every family. Bless every teacher and leader. And help us, Lord, to see spiritual fruit in your house. And throughout this community, I pray in Jesus' name, amen.